I'm going to talk about SVG and RaphaelJS. Uh, so this is vector graphics and allowing uh, you to see graphics at any scale, um, crystal clear and sharp, um, sharp in imagery uh, with vector graphics. So uh, just for the video's sake, I know you guys know uh, who I am. I'm Mark Urbanski created the jQuery UI date picker, wrote lots and lots on my website, markbansky.com. I've done lots and lots of user interface development. And again, this is uh, uh, my business. I'm JG International, and I uh, find lots of talented people to do consulting projects with, and then we run training events. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, uh, so what is SVG? Uh, the best way that I've heard it described is HTML for vector graphics, or just for graphics in general. It's, it's basically HTML. We get a set, of H, a set of tags that are much like HTML to describe images or describe graphics. Um, so I'm going to run through uh, a few of SVG's advantages. Uh, one size fits all. Now, there should be an asterisk next to this because um, definitely uh, creating, crafting a, a graphic for one specific scale um, is obviously going to be your best bet. But if you do have simple graphics that need to scale up and scale down, um, vector graphics provides a really great option. And especially like, um, y you know, if you want to go up onto a billboard, you know, your logo is going to look great going uh, to, to that size through vector. Um, so anyways, uh, so as I mentioned, HTML like tags for graphics, uh, DOM structure. So this is, it's got a whole document object model just like HTML does, uh, CSS3. Uh, works on it, so you can actually style these graphics with CSS, uh, which is really interesting. And then you've got all of the JavaScript events, like you can bind click events, etc., to um, these graphical elements. And uh, SVG by nature is actually SEO friendly and accessible. And what I mean by that is, if you have a text element with text in it, um, your you know, the search engines are going to be able to see that that's a text element and that contains this text. Because it's basically just like an XML or HTML file. It's also printer friendly. So you can scale up these uh, graphics, scale them down, uh, send them to printers. I actually worked with a company um, actually here locally that they render all of their graphics to SVG and then they send it to a printer to go print on to, uh, to actually cards, different sizes of cards. So uh, it, it is printer friendly. And um, it actually has pretty decent browser coverage. And uh, with Raphael, you can actually get into the old versions of IE if that's something you need. Um, so I'll be covering that later. OK, so let's break down some of these things. One uh, SVG file fits all. So, uh, with, with scaling bitmaps, um, you basically have to add more pixel data. Um, there, there, is, uh, there is some strategies where you can get bigger size, bigger size files uh, with comparable file size, but um, not getting into that. I mean, the basic concept is, is if you scale something up and you want it to look uh, great on that size, you're going to have to add more pixel data. You're going to have to describe the, the pixels, uh, or you're going to have to describe that graphic, and it's going to be bigger, right? And it, uh, as you scale it up or scale it down, you're going to have to you know, uh, manipulate that. Um, but with SVG, you just have one basic source file. So you have that XML file that describes graphics, and you can set it at this size or this size or whatever, and it's going to um, it's going to, in general, look really nice. Um, like I said, uh, you know, if, if you get too small, you're going to see some crowding uh, you know, of the, the edges. But it's, it's still going to look really like, sharp. right? So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but in general, you can scale these SVG files up and down, and uh, you're going to see really, really nice, clean lines. Um, so in this case, I just took two um, separate web pages. One was done in SVG and one was done 
uh, with a normal PNG and I just hit zoom a few times and of course the PNG zoomed looked like garbage and the SVG zoomed actually looked really really nice and clean and clear and that's uh, zoomed I think like five or six X uh, so yeah uh, that's it's pretty awesome um, the the tags portion so so the fact that it's like HTML um, let's dive into some of the elements that SVG gives us. So we have a text element that I described earlier. Um, we've got ellipse, rect, circle, line, polygon. These are some of your main elements. Let's dive into these. Uh, so with text, you're basically just um, putting H or you're putting text inside that text element. And it's pretty simple, right? But you need to describe where in the, uh, the SVG this is going to be displayed. So you have an X and Y coordinate. With the circle element, you've got CX, CY, which might be a little bit confusing at first, but really that's still X and Y. That's where the center of the circle starts. That's the center X and the center Y. And then your, ra your R is the actual radius. So how, uh, what's the radius of the circle? 200? Okay. Well, the diameter is obviously 400 here. And then um, you get a few attributes like fill and then you can just specify a color. Rectangle, uh, same concept, x, y with height, ellipse. Uh, this one was interesting. It's like, OK, what's this r, x, r, y thing? Well, r, x is actually the radius of x, and r, y is the radius of y. So that's how you get the, the wider um, than, the tall, than it is tall, and you get the ellipse shape. The line, um, you just specify two you know, x is two y's, and you draw a line. And uh, in this case, I'm showing you two new properties, which is stroke. So that's the stroke colors, and basically like fill, except it's the stroke. And then the stroke width. So in this case, the width of the line, the line is 25 uh, points or pixels or whatever you want to. I forget how that translates with retina. But anyways, with uh, the polygon, um, you basically specify uh, x, y pairs, and you just add spaces between them and commas between the x, y pairs. And so here you're just starting at 350x, 75y, and you're just drawing it, you know, the whole entire shape. And uh, the, the the thing with the polygon is you'll notice it's not ending at 350, 75. The 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 polygon actually draws a fill line between 321, 161 and 350, 75. And so that, that last line in the star is actually be dra being drawn uh, just automatically because it is a polygon, it's a closed element. A polyline is not closed. So here you're just doing the same exact thing except you're uh, just drawing the line and it's not being filled. And again, we have the stroke color and the stroke width. The path element is really where the power of SVG, you, that, that's, that's where that comes. I mean, you basically have these commands. So in this case, we're moving to this x and y, which is 100, 200. So you basically chain these commands together, and that's how you draw the shapes. The C is uh, uh, curve to, or I'm not really sure how all the the path elements work, but just know that it's you know it's just a set of commands that draws graphics. Um, yeah. Um, so grouping, basically you take these elements, these primitives, or you know, any of the elements, and you can wrap them in a G tag. And that G is basically just, you know, obviously grouping these elements. And in this case, I'm filling them both. It, you, when, you, when you set a property to the group tag, it will actually then set the, that property to its, um, its children, right? So, in this case, both of these are filled with 
um, black at 0.3 opacity. So you can see their intersection point is actually 0.6 opacity. The entire thing is rotated negative by negative 10 degrees. The entire thing, both of them have a stroke width of 5 and the stroke is black in color. This is what kind of separates, in my mind, what SVG is versus what Canvas is, right? Um, I think in the future there will be some inspection tools. Uh, you know, I, obviously Chrome Developer Tools is going to be working on uh, great tooling for Canvas, but it's just not there yet. But with, with SVG itself, it's just a DOM structure. It's just like HTML. So I can go in and inspect uh, SVG just like you would HTML. Um, I'll show you this in action. So I've got uh, this group, right? And uh, I just um, snap this down here, make it a little bigger. But you can see it's, it's just like normal HTML. I'm, I'm clicking on elements, I can change, you know, I can go in and change properties, you know. You just don't get this with Canvas because Canvas, you're piping everything out to a bitmap. You know, and with SVG, you know, there is at times performance uh, issues if you have a huge, you know, document tree of vector graphics and complex paths and stuff and it's it's maintaining that entire document tree but I mean that's the same thing with HTML right I mean if you have tons of elements and nested and whatever but you know in this case um, it just shows you kind of like hey this is I get this this is just like HTML um, I can apply you know rotate it a little bit more rotate the group a little bit more whatever change the properties um, so for me, it was, you know, as a HTML, CSS, and JavaScript developer, I thought, man, this is really familiar. This is, this is really something pretty cool. Well, and could you still use, like, JavaScript, too, to <coughs> manipulate it? And yep, change and that's what I, and yep, and that's what I mentioned. The, uh, the, all of the JavaScript that works with HTML works with SVG. So document.getElementById, you know, you could uh, set the group as an ID, uh, foo and then document docket element by d foo you know whatever and there's actually like j svg which is like jquery svg or something you can use jquery against svg just like you would normally and uh, the guy who actually co-wrote the date picker with me um, wrote that jquery svg so but uh, I particularly took uh, um, I enjoyed uh, Raphael um, and and the fact that it works in older Internet Explorer browsers, which was what my client requested. So I use Raphael, but you can use something like JSVG or um, um, D3, which I'll get into a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, you can use basic pure JavaScript. I'll get into some more examples with that later. So how do we use SVG? It's like, okay, great, you know, you've got these elements, you know, we can, you know, I, I get how that works, but how do I actually use this? So one is the, uh, one way to embed SVG is through an object tag. So in this case, you basically use this object tag and, uh, and then uh, you can add your SVG and that object will show up in your page. Um, and then when we were talking about scripting, well, how do you get access to that? Well, you can you can grab the object and then or grab the element and then do element.content document. That's your document, just like window, you know, just like your your document, right? Typing in document JavaScript, just get the element and do dot content document, and then there you go. You you're ready to to play around in in that object itself. What I've heard people doing for fallbacks um, is like let's say the browser doesn't support this object tag. What they do is uh, they'll put an image tag in here, you know, test.svg, and then, uh, you know, close out that object tag. 
so this is a way to you know have an interactive graphic for browsers that support SVG and then falling back to a regular static graphic for browsers that don't support SVG. So it just won't understand the object tag and it'll just render the image. But if it understands the object tag, it won't even look inside of it, right? So that's, that's a way I've heard of quite a few people use SVG. So that's, that's a possibility. The other way is to inline it. So with HTML5, the actual spec says that you can just inline SVG. You can just say, here's my SVG document. And it's this size. It's, it's width is 200. Its height is 200. And here's the rectangle element. Right? So with the HTML5 spec, um, you can just put SVG right in your document. Now, of course, our friends IE6, 7, and 8 don't support this, but 9 and up do. Um, and so that's where I showed you the object uh, with the fallback, and then also Raphael is an option. So uh, inline SVG support, um, I don't think this is like totally current, but I think it's pretty current. I mean, it's really, really uh, I probably snapped this a month ago or less, but you can see like inline SVG, IE9 and 10 uh, works, and then uh, you know Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, iOS 5 plus, um, even Android, certain versions of Android. Um, yeah, so I mean it has pretty dang good coverage for for inline SVG. Just you know the big ones are six, IE6, 7, and 8 right now kind of holding back the show. Um, you can actually add it as an image SRC. So instead of image SRC equals blah.jpg, you can just say test.svg. Uh, but in this case, all the scripting things that we were just talking about, none of that works. It's just an image tag. It's just going to render whatever that SVG is rendering. So in this case, we've got a uh, pretty similar-ish, uh, better, actually better browser support for that. Um, but uh, again, we're missing IE7 and 8. You can add it as a CSS background. So imagine having a div with a vector graphic as a background, having background size equals 100%, you know, 100%, and then just, uh, you know, having a responsive div and, and uh, you know, a vector bra graphic background. You know, in that case, you could take, uh, like, a lot of intra, like, the Firefox logo is vectorized. You can download the Firefox logo as an SVG. You can, there's a lot of, like, common logos and common symbols that are in SVG. And so in this case, this would be a way to make a responsive version that you wouldn't have to have separate images. It would just be, like, you know, and uh, it would just be this one SVG. And, and actually, uh, SVG looks sharper on retina displays. I mean, you don't have to make a 2x version of an SVG. You know, it just it works. It looks even better on retina. So browser support, again, missing IE 7 and 8. But it's pretty good browser support for, uh, for the rest. So here's where we're talking about the scripting. You know, you mentioned this earlier. Oh, wow. You know, it looks like HTML. So can I script against it? You know? Yes, you can. Same thing. Document about get element by ID star on click plus whatever. Now, this is something that completely blew my mind. Uh, and I'll show you why it, it blew my mind. Um, I, I hope it does for you, too. Uh, you can actually specify links around these vector elements. So in this case, I've got a link. Now, it's using xlink col uh, colon, which is a little bit of remnant. We're seeing a little bit of remnants of XML namespacing here. But it's not that much different. It's xlink and a colon, you know? Um, so we, we can wrap links around SVG elements, or even groups of SVG elements. So we're wrapping it around this. Now I'm going to show you this in action. 
So if I go to my page that I have here, okay, so we've got the state of Minnesota, state of Wisconsin, and I've got links wrapped around these path elements. These are drawn with path elements. Now with CSS, I've actually got hover uh, s attribute set. So look at that. But 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 look at how it works perfectly to this line. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, HTML provides us boxes, right? Have you ever tried to do an image uh, image map? <laughs> Cry me a river, like that's just terrible stuff. But like, look at that. Sucks. It just sucks. <laughs> I'm just saying, I have done it with image maps. It was terrible. Um, like that's just incredible. So. So how do I do this? Okay, so, okay, great, Mark. I want uh, the state of Iowa and the state of Minnesota. Or maybe I want the country of Italy and whatever neighboring countries are around it, right? So, I, so what you can do is actually type in, uh, like, Iowa map. Uh, and you, what you're going to do is you're going to probably hit uh, too, too much stuff. Let's do Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, which, which is really amazing, uh, all their maps, they've got tons of different maps, and they've got, uh, um, like in this case, it's broken down by county. Um, I don't know that they, they have an SVG. Let's just do like USA map. Um, so in this case, this is an S. Uh, it's it's actually available in in SVG format. I need to look at my screen. So full resolution SVG. So you can see all the elements kind of load in individually. And what I can do is I can inspect this element. And here's those commands that I talked about before. I can just copy and paste this com this path, and then I can paste it into my HTML, and I've got the path for Iowa. You know, I've got the outline, or South Dakota in this case. Uh, so that's nice, but um, the, the problem with this is you see that M command, it's going to 475 and 348. It's actually starting at a different point in the document. Let's just say I want to zero, zero that out. What we do is uh, download this file, open it in Illustrator, move the relevant pieces to zero, zero, save only those those elements out through Illustrator. Illustrator has an export to SVG. And now your element is zeroed out. So now it's at, at zero, zero. And you can do that with each individual, um, you know, whatever piece of the file you want to or whatever. So that's a strategy of being able to use these. In my case, I just literally copied and pasted the, the path. And then I, I added, a, I think, if you look in the code, um, I need to change it to different theme so it's easier to read. That's probably too big. Uh, so if we look at the code of my path link, um, you'll see I have just a translate of negative 600, zero. And then I scaled it up a little bit. So because it starts at 475, 128, it didn't make a whole lot of sense for it to be like sitting in the document. So I just translated it over. It's, that was just kind of a hack. But really, you would want to like open up Illustrator and zero that out. But then you have perfect uh, vector links, which is impossible to do other than poking your eyeballs out with image maps. So uh, you can take these SVG files and you actually can add CSS or use CSS on them. So you can actually do CSS transforms. 
So take a look at this example. Uh, it's actually, I, brought, I, I borrowed this from Brad Newberg's uh, presentation on SVG, which is great. Um, he showed this, which, yeah, so you're taking common um, image elements, adding vector, or using uh, vector as, uh, as the source, which I showed earlier, and then adding CSS trans, uh, uh, CSS animations to them. So now you get vector plus animation. Um, so obviously this guy probably built this up in, in Illustrator and then exported pieces of it and then animated it. So it's pretty cool. And I think we're going to obviously see tooling around this coming out. You yeah. mentioned that if you get too complex of like SVG, you know, too complex, it, like I work with a designer that does a lot of stuff in Illustrator and they're interested in animating some stuff. Would you know, something like this is obviously, yeah, built with Illustrator probably and export it that way. Like, is it pretty hard for the browser to handle that much? Marketing no, or? I'm talking about a lot of okay. DOM structure. So you can get pretty detailed in SVG files and no yeah. problem at all. Yeah, like, IE, I think for their marketing, they like had some, some Japanese guy animate like all this crazy stuff with SVG and it's like a full anime in SVG and it's it's like wow this is where things are going like it was really really cool to see um, so uh, you know unless they're doing something overly complex I mean browser can handle quite a bit um, and I like built an SVG app and it it worked on my iPhone and it was pretty performant so I don't know Vector graphics actually work on mobile. Anyway, um, SVG filters are coming out. Um, I'm not sure what the support is exactly, but this was built with uh, with SVG filters, and that's basically like kind of like Photoshop filters. Um, but you would be able to take vector and then have different kind of filters applied to, you know, that, and then you know, just like Photoshop, right? You take element, apply a filter. And it changes the look and look of the elements behind it. Um, filter support's not too bad. I mean, we have it in quite a few browsers, but IE 10, Safari 6 is kind of a killer. Um, OK, so last time I sourced my sources about uh, talking to the creators of jQuery Mobile. In this case, I uh, learned from Dmitry Baranovsky about Raphael. I just, uh, um, I th and we hired him on a couple of things, um, which I'll get into. But, but basically, he, he taught me Raphael. And uh, I have to say, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting technology. Uh, like SVG as well as uh, Raphael really allows you to take vector graphics and make them accessible and approachable. Um, I just working with vector graphics directly um, is, I don't know, it's it's pretty intense, and and Raphael handles a lot of a lot of the compl complexity, and I'll get into that. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is from Dimitri. He's like, oh, okay, Safari works, Firefox works, Opera, but IE, what? Yeah. So uh, what Raphael does is it provides you a way to describe your vector graphics in JavaScript. And that JavaScript will then generate, if it's in IE 6, 7, 8, it will generate VML, which is Microsoft's old proprietary vector markup language. Right? So it provided a transport to take vector declarations and make them uh, output to, to VML for IE and SVG for everybody else. But now uh, IE gave up on that, and now they're supporting SVG moving forward with IE 9 and 10 and whatever. So from my perspective, when I was working on this project, I had to support IE 7 and 8. I don't think I had to support 6. But for me, it was like the jQuery of vector graphics. It's like, 
OK, now I can write these vector graphics and it works in both browsers. Great. That's awesome. And it provides me a common you know, API for it. You know, so I have these common methods, and they're going to work in IE7, 8, and all these other things in SVG. And then it also comes with some utilities to make vector sane. Uh, from my perspective, managing transforms and stacks of transforms is just ridiculously complex. And in this case, Raphael really helps us out with that. So you have all your same basic primitives. You have your rectangle and your circle. You have your attributes, which you know in this case uh, is stroke, dimensions, etc. All your normal um, HTML attributes. Uh, Raphael just provides ways to interact with all of these things. Right with events, we actually get um, click and touch, and drag even works across both touch and and uh, mouse events. Um, you get your animation and easing, and you can manage sets and uh, also the transforms, as I mentioned. So this is kind of uh, Raphael's uh, set of things that it kind of helps you with, right? Or what it provides you an API for. So the primitives in Raphael is very much like you would uh, use in just pure SVG, except for the params are ordered. So that can be a little bit confusing when you come to a project. You're like, well, is it x, y, whatever? But I mean, it's pretty basic, right? So you have a rectangle that starts at x and y, and then it has a width and a height and a radius. Uh, that's not right. It has a r, I think, is scaling ratio. I, I don't know. I forget. What's that? Yeah, the R and rect. Yeah. Border radius. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, that just tripped me up when I looked at this slide after a month. Um, the ellipse, again, C, X, C, Y, R, X, R, Y. Um, attributes looks exactly like jQuery. We've got, you know, attribute, set it, or set groups of attributes, exactly like jQuery. Events in Raphael, so we can do dot click, just like in jQuery. Uh, the touch start event exists, and drag actually maps to both, like I said, click and touch. So when I'm using the drag event in Raphael, it actually works on the iPad. So I have I built an app that works on desktop, and then you pull out your iPad, and the same drag code works. And you just pass in your event handlers. So like when it's moving, when it's start, and when it's, when it's end, uh, it'll call those callbacks. Animations, same thing with jQuery. I can just animate the stroke with. Um, I'll show you a quick example. Uh, so in this case, I'm uh, when I click, I'm animating the radius of the circle. Uh, to 50, I'm toggling between 50 and 300, and uh, you know, based on when I click it, and then I'm using the elastic easing. So there's some easing built into Raphael. But this is JavaScript animations, and so when I click on that, you know, I get uh, elastic transforms of the radius, you know, to 50 to 300. Sets in Raphael. So basically, a set is kind of essentially what a group is. You know, I showed you that group tag. A set is basically that. So I take, I create a set, and I push elements into that set, and then I call set dot attribute stroke width five is going to set all the elements stroke width to five in the set. And then I can iterate over the set using set dot for each, and then I get the element in the callback that I'm working with. So I can iterate through them all and set some properties. Or, yeah, whatever I want to do with that. So transforms. This is, uh, this to me is like the main feature of Raphael. Um, managing transforms is a nightmare in um, in vector graphics land. Uh, doing that natively, um, but with Raphael, you're able to basically describe. Um, just like that path, you know, I showed path has commands. 
uh, it works like that. So T is actually your move um, command. So in this case, 10, 10 would be move. Uh, I think there should be a comma between that, actually. But basically, move to x and y coordinate. Um, S is scale. So in this case, you can say scale it by 10, 10x and 10y. Um, and then uh, you can, I think this is optional, but you can specify the point it's scaling around. So in the case of if I have a, 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 a star and I, I scaled it around 0, 0, it's going gonna, it's gonna to scale like this because 0, 0 is up here. Right? But if I scale it around the center of the star, the center point, it's going to go like this. Right? And uh, yeah. So scaling around the point can affect um, how, how things are viewed. Same thing with rotation. So rotating, this totally confused me because I was creating a whole, uh, basically the, the app allows you to configurate blueprints, uh, basically blueprint pieces. And uh, these blueprint pieces, you could like snap them together and you could rotate sets of them, right? Well, rotating confused me because when you rotate, you know, I'm, I've got this thing here and then I, I do a rotate of 45 degrees and it's just like off the screen. I'm like, where'd it go? What the heck? You know, well, that's because by default it rotates around zero, zero. So if, if I, you know, if I do this, then it makes sense to you, right? But when I was just playing with Raphael at first, I was like, what's going on here? Well, what you actually have to do is uh, use like, what, I don't think I have it in this slide deck, but um, get B box is a method where you can get the, uh, the X and Y and the, uh, the width and height. Um, and so you can determine with get B box uh, where this element exists and you can determine its center and then rotate around that center point and then it's going to rotate, you know, like this, right? So, so even if you rotate it 1,080 degrees, it's just going to stay in place because you're rotating three times. Anyway, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, so it's just going to rotate around the center of that element. So that was the biggest thing that tripped me up. Um, okay, and then the second thing is that confused me is that capitals blow out prior transforms and so capital transforms blow out prior transforms so if i have moving it so if i apply move 45 45 it's going to move 45 45 um, but then if i have another t capital t transform that's 35 35 now it's here right but if i use lowercase t 45, 45, it's going to go here. And then lowercase t, 35, 35, it's going to go here. Right? So the lowercase uh, transforms stack on each other. The capital ones are going to blow out all prior. So this is your absolute transforms, and this is your relative or your uh, yeah, transforms. So um, in this case, uh, Stacking is, can get very, very complicated because where does this thing exist after I stacked, you know, five rotations and six transforms and three scales, where the heck is this thing now? Um, so that's where this comes in, which is the matrix.split method, which this is something that Dimitri just told me about, and I'm like, it's not in the API docs. He's like, oh, yeah, I should do that. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, well, probably it's in the API docs now, but when I was using it, it wasn't. And it was basically like splitting gets the result of all of the transforms. So it will tell you that even if I applied 16 different transforms, you know, now this thing's moving all over the place and it's right here. I do, I call matrix.split on that element and I know exactly what its X and Y is. Yeah? Does that differ from getting the B box on 
I think they use the same thing under the hood, but the thing is get B box will tell me like the X and Y, the width and the height of the, the box. It'll draw a box around it. But um, matrix.split says, what's, a, what's the result of all of these transforms? Not what it's width and height and X and Y is, but what are the transforms that are applied to it? So, the, so if, I, if I applied 15 rotations and all with varying degrees, and all with different, let's say, one I rotated on zero, zero, one I rotated in the center of the element, one I rotated on this element of this set, and I added all the rotations together, um, what it end up being is it'll tell me like, it's X and Y is this, and its rotation is 35 degrees. You know, so it, it basically gets the resulting combined of all the transforms, and it tells you, this is its transform now. And so what I tend to do is I might stack a few relative transforms, but then at some point, like in the case of saving the state of your application to the server, you might want to loop through all of the elements, get the resulting transforms, put it serialized to a JavaScript object, so then you can save it to the server, and you can save the state and get the state later and, and display it in the right position, right? So this gets a result of all the transforms applied to an object with this element.split, or element.matrix.split. I think you have to do it with each individual element. I think you have to do it with each individual element. So what I do, I, I don't actually apply transforms to the set. What I do is I, um, when, when like I'm dragging, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll loop through the set and I'll apply all the transforms to each of the individual items in the set. I mean, that's just how I had to do it. Maybe there's a better, more efficient way. You would say like, oh, well, why can't I just do that to the group or the set? I think that makes sense and that's a reasonable request, but, and maybe you can, um, but as far as in the API, I thought it was just like the element you can do that on. And so you could, uh, I think you could apply the transforms to the set, but. Yeah, so you can apply transforms to a group, and that group will be reflected throughout everything else. But if you want to get the, the resulting of an entire set is what he's asking. And I'm not sure if you can do like set.matrix.split. I'm not sure. You'd, you'd have to try that on your own. But what you can do is loop through all the elements in the set and do matrix.split on all of them and save their state. So that's actually what I'm currently doing. Obviously, it'd be more performant if I could do it on the set. But in my case, the blueprint elements, like when the user's interacting, they interact with the sets. But I actually only care about what each individual element is doing in the end, because I have to place them on a, on a blueprint. But um, yeah, you'll, you'll have to play with that a little bit. But I'm just at least trying to point you in a, in a direction of some areas to explore. Um, the other aspect of stacking transforms is if I do want to stack um, multiple T's and I don't want to um, I don't want to keep having to build up the entire string and pass it in right well I can just do dot 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 which means keep the existing transforms and then add this one and you can put dot 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 on the end so in the case of I was totally confused because I added a rotation at the end of the stack, which means after all of these things are done, then you rotate it. And like, so because they stack my thing like rotated weird, and I was like, what is going on? Well, what I ended up doing to fix that is I said, rotate it in the beginning around this point you know, rotate 45 degrees in the beginning when it, when it doesn't have any transforms applied and then transform everything else, right? So you have to understand that things stack and they affect the prior. And so that's what I'm trying to explain of how crazy vector graphics can get. But between element.matrix.split, get bbox, and um, the capital, uh, so in the case of uh, you can get all the transforms stacked by just saying dot transform. 
and you can get you can get an object that re represents the transforms and you can like manipulate keys in there and then pass it back into the transform method there's a lot of interesting things that you can do to uh to work with these but it's vector graphics gets a little intense just fyi but uh, with Raphael, I think it's much more manageable. Um, Raphael has like a set of icons, which are kind of cool. Um, so you can check those out. Um, JSVG is kind of interesting because like you, st you know how you minify and you can cat um, CSS or JavaScript? Well, you, JSVG is kind of the same thing. You're, you're concatting all, of, since they're all like XML documents, you're just kind of like pumping them all into one request and sending them down the pipe. And then you use JavaScript to extract the individual SVGs out of the stack. So JSVG is kind of interesting because it's basically like concat, it's kind of like minifying or um, concatting a bunch of JavaScripts together or CSS together. Fabric.js is interesting because you can render SVG on Canvas um, it seems to be pretty performant. Um, in that case, you can have vector graphics, you know, um, the results of the vector graphics rendered as a bitmap. Kind of interesting. Um, uh, I created this Vectron thing, which basically, uh, what it does is it pulls SVG in with Ajax. And then it converts them into Raphael.js. Basically, uh, because Raphael.js is a JavaScript API, you are writing all of your directives for vector in JavaScript itself. SVG, you're doing XML, right? So I'm basically just, or you know, this this markup language, basically just. Uh, and this is what we hired. Uh, uh, Dimitri to do where he just takes that SVG and just uh, um, parses it and turns it into Raphael just directives and uh, so then you can then take that vector graphic and render it in IE 7 and 8 you know because you're pulling that vector graphic in you're parsing into SVG or to Raphael JS and then you're you're all putting it in for IE 7 and 8 and so the, the whole, like I have a pretty robust SVG application and it's actually working in IE7 and 8. Like it, it actually works pretty well because it's using Microsoft VML. And I mean, it's basically doing the same things. So that's an interesting project. I've seen where like complex paths get kind of like broken in this. They don't parse correctly. So if you do have a big commercial project, just be like, Hey Dimitri, fix wrapper. It's R A P P A R. Wrap bar JS is the parser that Dimitri wrote. My, Vectron is just a wrapper around. It's like a, a jQuery plugin around um, wrap bar parser. But yeah, if something doesn't work, just be like, Dimitri, it doesn't. This SVG is not parsing correctly, and then pay him a little bit of money. I'm sure he'll fix it. Um, yeah, so this is actually kind of interesting because right now we're doing sprites, CSS sprites everywhere. You know, like, it, and then sprites with responsive web design doesn't really work well. It gets kind of wacky. Um, uh, I, at least, uh, yeah, because you can't do background size 100% because that doesn't work with the sprite. Uh, so anyways, this is kind of interesting. Um, I think this only works in Firefox. It might work in Chrome now, but basically what you're doing is you're taking, you can take icons or CSS images or anything. And since uh, um, you can actually add CSS images or you can add images inside of an SVG, basically you're putting all of your images on zero, zero in the SVG. Everything is on zero, zero. <coughs> And um, and so it's not like stacked, you know, stacked into a big huge sprite. It's all stacked on top of each other, right? And then you use pound, and then the ID of, you know, the actual 
element inside of your SVG stack, and then it will display that particular image. So you're only displaying one of the stack on 00. zero. So this could be potentially interesting. I'm not saying that you should use this because it's obviously experimental, but, it, but it's interesting. And then this is where I personally would love to like dive into more. Um, D3 is freaking incredible. I mean, it is, it's just ridiculous. Like D3 has some of the craziest visualizations with uh, uh, with with SVG. Um, I wish I could. So in this case, this is like the map, but it, it's uh, all these elements are linked together. I'm not sure how this would particularly be useful, but <laughs> but like it's pretty damn cool. Um, in this case, uh, you know, you're drilling into data. Um, I, I wish I could show you the most mind-blowing one. Um, maybe I, um, um, well, I'll keep searching for it later, but he has all these really, really interesting, um, and there's some like default views out of the, um, out of the box, but uh, yeah, D3 has a lot of like really interesting views to data out of the box. Um, D3 creator website. Uh, oh, Diablo 3, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's MBO stock, yeah. Mike, the stock. Yeah, D3 is going to come up with a lot of Diablo 3. Um, I really want to. Yeah, well, I'll have to keep looking for it, but um, anyway, he has lots of Lots of interesting demos on, on this. You can take a look at his website. Um, but D3 definitely has crazy, crazy visual visualizations uh, for, for data. And then, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter, of course. And uh, thank you all so much for coming down. Uh, yeah, it's been awesome. <laughs>